So you just heard a, a story about uh, shelter belt in Canada, and I guess I'm here to carry the Canadian story. Um, my, the title for my talk is Trees Increase Soil Carbon Storage and Bacteria Abundance But Not Enzyme Activities in Agriculture Systems in Central Alberta, Canada. So I slightly altered my title from the abstract from my hand notice. First of all, I would like to thank my co-authors, uh, Mark, Sam, Farah, uh, Samson, and Chitin. We have uh, a bit of turnover. So, um, Sam was the first, first postdoc, and then Farah took over, and then Samson, the current postdoc, and uh, Mark has been a, a PhD student on the project, and Chitin has been a master student on the project, and Ken and Edward uh, co uh, collaborators on the project. So also to continue some of the talks on climate change, obviously this is another talk on climate change, uh, looking at carbon sequestration mainly in three different agricultural systems in central Alberta. Uh, you've probably heard of these uh, um, you know, many times, about global climate change and the predicted temperature change. You know, if that's going to occur, obviously that's clearly scary. And we made some linkages between greenhouse gas emissions and uh, temperature changes as being described over here, although uh, not necessarily everybody agree with that science. But we also know that in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of these are coming from the agriculture sector. For example, globally, agriculture accounted for 25% of the emissions of CO2, 50% of the methane, and 70% of the NCO. <coughs> Obviously, NGO is a really important greenhouse gas, so agriculture plays a really significant role in increasing the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. With that, agriculture is so important, so obviously agriculture has a really significant role to play in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we can employ conservation practices to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel usage, just as Jim was talking about the, in the really first uh, talk this afternoon. Um, in addition to that, obviously, we can try to employ biological means to decrease <coughs> the greenhouse gas emissions through means such as to decrease the, the surface resource structure. And along that avenue, obviously, we have quite a few different tools available to us. For example, no-till or carbon and retention and uh, environmental cover cropping. Um, agroforestry is being mentioned here as one of the potential means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through conservation practices. Um, we know ag what uh, agroforestry is about, and over here, the strong interaction between the trees or the perennial uh, woody uh, species and the agricultural ag annual cropping systems would play a strong role in increasing carbon uh, storage, increasing carbon uh, sequestration as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> so what do we all know about uh, agroforestry and carbon sequestration uh, from data from KK Neil and uh, others? We know that um, globally we have about one billion hectares of land area under agriculture. And with the carbon sequestration potential between uh, 0.29 to about 15 megatons per hectare per year, just based on the above ground biomass production alone, that translates into 30 to 300 megagrams um, of carbon per hectare uh, that could be potentially sequestered in the top one meter of the soil. So again, that's an indication of substantial um, carbon sequestration potential in the portion systems. We also know that carbon can be, so organic carbon can be separated into different poles. Uh, the labor pole, for example, has really um, short turnover time versus the recalcitrant for as a much longer ranging between 100 to 1,000 year turnover time, so much longer mean turnover times. So we want, obviously, want to increase carbon sequestration in that recalcitrant pool. If we can achieve that through agriculture, that would be beneficial as well. And so organic carbon um, stability or protection can be achieved by the association with smaller particles, soil particle sizes, the silt and the clay particles in the soil. And aggregating the soil can also lower the decomposition rate and increase the carbon uh, stability in the soil. So agroforestry systems can reduce 
potentially also reduce soil erosion and reduce the frequency of disturbance and as a way of increasing the carbon stability and biodiversity in agriculture. But we also know that agricultural systems, their effect on carbon sequestration um, and other ecosystem services obviously is going to be dependent on the type of agricultural systems implemented, the climatic region or, or region, uh, region that we are talking about, uh, the soil type and the fertility and their ability will in fact uh, agricultural systems ability to sequester the carbon. Um, plant species composition, another really important factor. So with all that, that means that in order to understand agricultural systems role in carbon sequestration, we really need to develop or study um, at site-specific level. Um, when we try to look at look up numbers on potentials for carbon sequestration in different agricultural systems in Canada, uh, we were quite disappointed that there were actually not that many studies being done on this. I mean, obviously, uh, Suresh is going to talk on some of the work that we've been doing in Ontario looking at the um, area carbon systems, but you know, again, it's really limited number of studies on that. So and this type of uh, uh, you know, background, we initiated this research project looking at carbon sequestration and the greenhouse gas emissions. It's three different agricultural systems in Central Alberta. Uh, we were really lucky to get funding from the federal government. And the three systems we're looking at is the Shirtlebilt system, the Hedgerow system, and the Silver Pastoral system um, that we have studied. The research objectives for our study is to um, are to determine soil organic carbon storage distribution with depths, and the depth is going down to about a meter, or uh, in, in this data set, it's going down to 75 centimeters. And these are all in comparison <coughs> with uh, the sugarbilt system, the hedgerow system, and the grazed wood, uh, woodland or civil pasture system in comparison with adjacent agricultural land use systems. And the second objective is to examine the stability of soil organic carbon and as well as the bacterial abundance and enzyme activities and try to link the bacterial abundance and enzyme activities back to the stability of soil uh, organic carbon. So along these two objectives, we set up the two hypotheses. The first one is to say that agricultural systems would increase soil carbon sequestration and <coughs> soil carbon stability along the reasoning that I have already <coughs> provided because of the, uh, less frequent disturbance and therefore the carbon, uh, there is more opportunity for carbon to accumulate and that should increase the carbon sequestration as well increase the carbon stability. The second hypothesis is, uh, is that uh, agricultural systems should increase bacterial abundance as well as enzyme activities and again those are all in comparison with agricultural land use. So just to recap again, we are looking at three different agricultural systems. It's the shoulder belt, the age row, and the civil pasture system in comparison with adjacent annual crop, uh, crop or annual crop or agricultural cropping systems. And so this uh, civil pasture system, this is uh, grazed aspen forest in comparison with grazed uh, pasture and the shoulder belt uh, and the stage row is in comparison with the agricultural production systems. So obviously within here we have uh, two different sets of comparisons. We're comparing <coughs> different agricultural systems and also within each agricultural system we're comparing the tree component of the agricultural systems as, compar as comparison to the agricultural production system. But the research sites, we established 36 research sites and so 12 sites in each agricultural system and these 36 sites were widely distributed um, with centered along Edmonton where the University of Alberta is based. And so we're talking about about 200 kilometers east-west and about close to 300 kilometers north-south. Um, so we had a lot of traveling to do and that was one of the biggest challenges in, within this project. Now in terms of site sampling design, um, obviously we are looking at, uh, we established two transacts, one transact within the forest uh, component of the agriculture system and another transact a few tree heights away from either the shelter belt system or the hedgerow or the grazed forest. And within each transact we, we collected uh, multiple 
source samples from multiple points and uh, made up a composite sample for our analysis. And these are the pictures showing some of the work we've been doing in storing the um, chambers uh, or the collars for gas sampling, gas sampling including uh, using the Lyco 8100 as well as static gas chambers for data for collection, salt pit digging, and uh, salt <coughs> something. Now, getting to. Um, <coughs> eight minutes. Okay, great. Um, so, getting into the data, this, this is uh, some of the basic soil properties in the three agriculture systems that we are studying. Um, note that uh, <coughs> over here I have presented the data by the three different agriculture systems and then by the two land use systems, uh, the forest area and the annual or agriculture, we call the agricultural uh, production area. If the data is presented like this, this is an indication that there is no interaction between the agricultural system and the land use system. And if there is significant interaction, then the data will be presented somewhat differently. And I'll show you an example of that. So the first one is looking at the differences in the soil pH, morning and nitrate concentration, as well as water holding capacity among these different agriculture systems, taking the agriculture system as a whole, um, we are seeing that obviously variations in these soil properties. Uh, we see significant differences in the pH between the hedgerow and the shelterbed system. Uh, we see significant differences in the ammonium concentration between the shelterbed system and the silvopastral system. Um, and we didn't really see significant differences uh, between among these agricultural systems in terms of the nitrate concentration as well as the water holding capacity. Um, when we come to the comparison between the two land use systems, between the forest and the agriculture, we see much more dramatic differences or more, more consistent differences. We see higher pH in the forest ecosystems, um, surprisingly, uh, than in the agricultural production system. We see higher ammonium concentration in the forest <coughs> soils than in the agriculture. So this is quite ex as expected uh, in the forest soils, typically ammonium uh, or nitrification rates are typically suppressed and therefore we would see higher ammonium concentrations and uh, lower nitrate concentration, although the nitrate concentration was not significantly different between the two land uses. We also see higher water holding capacity in the forest soils. Now, <laughs> coming to the soil organic carbon in both in the bulk soil as well in as as well as in the different particle size fractions, um, this is really one of the key pieces of information from our work. Uh, the bulk soil carbon orga organic carbon concentration has been plotted in the really last group of columns, and this is indicating that um, among the three different agricultural systems, there was a lot higher organic carbon concentration in the silvicultural system than in the shelter bill system. So the shelter bill system seems to be always somewhat unique as compared to the other two agricultural <coughs> systems. Looking at the soil organic carbon concentration in the fine fraction and the coarse fractions, you note that the soil organic carbon concentration in the medium size fraction is missing over here. And that's because in the medium size there was strong, there was significant uh, agricultural system by land use uh, interaction. So that's been presented in another slide. Again, we see that the, there are differences among the three different systems. Uh, the fine fraction, the soil organic carbon concentration in the fine fraction was significantly higher in the uh, shield, uh, in the hedgerow system as compared to the shield of system. So this <coughs> would indicate that the soil organic carbon in the hydro system would be more stable because <coughs> of their association, greater association in the fine particle size. Um, comparing between the agricultural and the forest land use, the first column over here, the green one, is forest, and the second, the yellow one, is the agriculture. Um, again, Fairly similar to the basic soil properties, we are seeing that the soil organic carbon concentration to be much more strongly 
expressed in terms of the differences between the two land uses, um, regardless of the bulk soil that we are talking about or their distribution in the uh, fine and cross fractions, uh, they were higher in the forest ecosystem or in the forest soils than in the agricultural soils. Now this is the soil organic carbon concentration in the medium fraction <coughs> because of the significant interaction between the agricultural systems and the land uses. Here we are seeing that in the semicultural system, there was no difference uh, in terms of soil organic carbon concentration between uh, the two land uses. But in the hedgerow system and in the chilogrid system, the soil organic carbon concentration was much higher in the forested soil than in the crop land, in the agricultural soil. When we convert these soil organic carbon concentrations into the so-called carbon density, which is expressed as kilograms of carbon per square meter per centimeter of soil thickness, um, we are seeing really similar results. Um, the first one is on the organic horizon. Obviously, in the agricultural system, we don't really have organic horizon accumulating because of the annual disturbance. So in the forest system, we have a lot of organic carbon being accumulated in organic, in the Canadian system, we call this LFH, the forest floor. So regardless of whether it's, we're talking about hedgerow or shadow belt or silpastral system, we have a lot of organic carbon being accumulated in the organic horizon. But when, then we, when we get into the uh, inorganic horizons, 0 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 50, etc., uh, particularly in the top uh, 30 centimeters of soil, we are seeing dramatic um, increases in the soil organic carbon concentration, sorry, in soil organic uh, carbon density uh, in the forest land use <coughs> compared to the agricultural land use. So that's again fairly significant confirming to the fact that regardless whether we are looking at uh, soil organic carbon concentration or soil organic carbon density, uh, the forest area always had higher soil organic carbon uh, in the system. When we convert these soil organic carbon density into the soil carbon stock, then this is expressed as kilograms of carbon per square meter. Um, again, we see dramatic differences between the forested area as compared to the agricultural land use system that's adjacent. This is the hedgerow, this is the shadow belt, and this is the pasture. Um, we can even take out the organic carbon accumulation in the forest floor we're still seeing really significant differences uh, between the mineral source, between the uh, agricultural system and the cropping or the agricultural production system. All right. Now, the first postdoc, uh, Dr. Banerjee, uh, did a, some sort of a side project. It was interesting understanding potentially some of the microbiological um, mechanisms for supporting the higher carbon sequestration in the, agri uh, in the forest area of the agricultural system uh, as compared to agricultural production systems. And so he did uh, some qPCR and this is the bacteria uh, gene copy numbers. This is a, on a log scale, so obviously uh, regardless of the system that we are talking about, they all have more than 10 to the 6 uh, gene copies per gram of soil. So this is indicating the abundance of the bacteria community. What's interesting is, again, the shadow belt <coughs> system seems to be quite unique. There was no significant differences in terms of the um, bacteria community abundance. But coming to the hedgerow and the subcultural systems, uh, the bacteria community abundance was higher <coughs> in the forested soils than in the agricultural soils. So there's some uh, conformity to the higher carbon sequestration in the forested area. He then did uh, the relative abundance of the major bacteria phyla and the dominant classes of proteobacteria in the system. So this is being expressed as a relative abundance. Um, the total of these um, phyla altogether was expressed at 100%. Um, the ones that are fairly dominant in the system include the actinobacteria, the bacteroidids, 
And then the alpha proteobacteria, the beta proteobacteria, as well as the um, gamma proteobacteria. And this is being represented by the red, the, uh, the green, uh, the gray, yes, and the brown color. And the last one is the dark green. And these both are abundant in the system as well as quite changeable in among these different systems. So they likely play a significant role in influencing the um, carbon <coughs> decomposition, the carbon cycling in the systems. And we also have data on the relative abundance of the 15 most abundant bacteria genera. Um, the most abundant, obviously, is this one. Um, the the Germano, um, Germanus, as well as the Pseudomonas. Okay, the Pseudomonas is the one that has really large differences among the different systems here and again. Now, the last thing that um, Dr. Banaji did was to conduct a network analysis, trying to understand these different bacterial communities and to see how they are connected to each other, as well as to what are some of the abiotic factors that's there to influence um, their relatedness, their, their co-occurrence in the ecosystem. And the most interesting finding was that uh, uh, through this network analysis that we find that the pH had a lot of connections with the existence of these different uh, bacteria communities, as well as the total, uh, the different carbon fractions. And this is the total carbon, the dissolved organic carbon, the total organic carbon, as well as um, I think those uh, most of the carbon uh, fractions that we looked at. And therefore, uh, based on that, we put up some separate network analysis on pH and the different uh, organic carbon fractions uh, to indicate, again, the connections between the carbon fractions and the different uh, bacteria communities in the soil. And here, uh, we're looking at the pH inferences on the different bacteria communities. So the conclusion from the network analysis is that among the soil properties that we looked at, uh, pH had a dominant role to control the bacteria communities as well as the different fractions of so organic carbon. Um, my second postdoc, uh, Dr. Farrah uh, Fakami, had expertise in enzymes, and so she did some enzyme analysis. She looked at five or six different enzymes. Uh, the first four over here are enzymes responsible for carbon mineralization in the system. The fifth one, the phosphate hat, uh, hat, was responsible obviously for the cycling uh, phosphorus. And the, the last one, this is number six, the, um, the nitrogen acetyl group for 70 days is responsible for nitrogen mineralization. Uh, all of the six enzyme activities that we studied, this unfortunately was based on only the 10 to 0 to 10 centimeter of the soil, and based on one time sampling in the middle of the global season in July uh, 2013, uh, we did see that the enzymes, if it's being plotted on these solid lines and the solid uh, symbols, these represent the enzymes in the tree areas of the agricultural system versus the dotted lines and the dot uh, or the open symbols representing the enzyme activities in the agricultural uh, soils. Uh, it does indicate that the enzyme activities were higher in the tree areas in forest soils than in the uh, agricultural soils. But unfortunately, in terms of the statistical analysis, these differences were not significant. So from all the data we have presented so far, uh, the indications are that the two hypotheses were essentially accepted uh, with exception, the enzyme activities were not statistically significant, so that part of it, um, the, uh, the process was rejected. The 
no metric mode dimensional scaling analysis, so this has been plotted over here, indicates that the pH uh, was one of the most important factors affecting the enzyme activities in our agriculture system. So to quickly conclude my presentation, uh, we find that three base components of agriculture systems had <coughs> more so organic carbon than adjacent agricultural field, both in the bulk soil as well as in most cases in this different size fractions. And so those are all, again, good news that um, our hypothesis was accepted or was supported and agriculture systems where if trees are included, they would be beneficial for increasing um, carbon sequestration. Secondly, greater distribution of soil organic carbon in the fine fraction in the forest than in the agriculture soils indicates that greater soil organic carbon stability in the forest soils. Again, that will be really good news as well. Uh, the more, the, the greater stability of the soil organic carbon in the forest soil obviously would uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And number three, land use systems had a much stronger effect on soil bacteria communities. So pH and carbon content were the major determinants of soil bacteria community burdens. However, so enzymes involved in carbon mineralization in particular tended to be greater in the forest soils but was not statistically significant. And lastly, the high bacterial abundance in the forest soils may be linked to enhanced um, soil carbon storage in the agriculture system. Unfortunately, more analysis will be needed to uh, more closely look at the relationship between bacterial community <coughs> and uh, carbon storage in these systems. So, um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.